first afternoon panel is Cognition, a brief scan of BC initiatives, which will be moderated by my colleague and friend, Dr. Ashok Krishnamurthy. He's a psychiatrist, and he's currently the medical director for Vancouver Community Mental Health Services. Ashok. Uh, welcome back after uh, your lunch. Definitely this session is not going to be a sedate session, so you have to be awake, well attentive, and uh, we have got uh, five presentations, each of which will be about 10 to 12 minutes, and then you will have an opportunity to ask questions uh, by the end of it. So uh, without wasting too much of time, um, the first speaker is going to be Dr. Tom Eman. Uh, he's going to present on guided self-care for cognitive problems associated with psychotic disorder. I would welcome you, Tom. Yeah, hi. Thanks, everybody. Um, I'm going to give a talk that's not going to involve any Greek symbols for statistical uh, you know, significance or anything like that. This is going to be a, a very practical uh, a guide that I'm going to be talking about. So this is not theoretical. It's very practical. I'm going to talk about uh, the Dealing with Psychosis Toolkit. And in a nutshell, the uh, toolkit is uh, a, a document that we created that provides individuals with psychosis a range of tools to assist in their recovery. And that the toolkit is designed to be used with a support person. So that support person could be a friend or a family member or a clinician or a peer support worker or whoever. I'll talk a little bit more about the, what the role of that support person is. And the third uh, key part of my very brief presentation is to uh, uh, instill in you the, the fact that this tool guide has a chapter on uh, cognition. And uh, in that chapter, we provide some simple strategies uh, for, uh, that will help people to uh, compensate for some of the cognitive problems. So why did we develop this toolkit? About 10 or 12 years ago, uh, the Ministry of Health was concerned with um, addressing the issue of chronic illnesses, and that would include things like arthritis or, or diabetes, and they wanted to promote self-care, or what was called self-help in those days, uh, and the model was going to be extended to mental health. So about six or seven years ago, Garrett Vandelier, um, uh, yeah, who, who will be presenting later this afternoon, uh, phoned me up and said, hey, Tom, you know, let's create a self-help guide for people with psychotic disorders. And, and I said, well, you know, there aren't a whole lot of models around that we can use. Uh, they just don't make self-help materials for people with psychotic disorders. And he said, Precisely. Let's, let's do this. And so we decided we would, but we'd add a little twist to it by instead of having a person just work on it by themselves, we thought sometimes two heads are better than one and it's nice to do things together. So we'd, we'd create a, a support person. And when, when we were deciding on making this uh, toolkit, we really wanted to make sure that uh, a cognition was included in, in this toolkit because there was a, a real lack uh, of, of awareness about the importance of cognition in psychotic disorders and uh, a, a real neglect of it in, in clinical services, and there was just no availability. So we thought that if we could get this on the radar in, in through the use of this you know, easy and accessible instrument, that people would become aware of it and that we'd at least provide them with a few compensatory strategies that they could start to use. So there's 10 sections to this um, toolkit. All of them are pretty interactive, so people write things and, and um, you know, have worksheets and do brainstorming, and uh, there's lots of opportunities to do that. See, in the development of the, of the look of it, we were concerned about um, both the teaching aspects of it as well as the look. So we recruited a graphic designer whose uh, son has schizophrenia, and so she was very sensitive to the, the look and the layout, including the use of the various colors and fonts and, and how things were laid out, and she worked very closely with uh, another person that we recruited who's a special education specialist who also could you know, make sure that the language was good and that the pedagogical kinds of aspects were, uh, were, were good, and those two worked together a lot. 
The, the guide is about 100 pages long, of which the longest chapter is the chapter for the support person. So the support person is not a teacher, and it's not a dictator. It's someone who's there to sort of uh, facilitate uh, the, uh, the working through and, uh, you know, providing encouragement and having a, a sort of foil to run things off of. So, you know, sometimes people are going to brainstorm about something, then they could... Uh, you know, uh, run it by the support person or, you know, that kind of, so it's that kind of a role. It's not like a, you need to do this, you know, and here's how. Uh, so each in the, in the support guide, there's tips, uh, given to the support person. It gives detailed descriptions of the content and the learning goals and also a heads up to the support person about where their name is going to be mentioned in the self-care guide so that they can kind of know, oh, this is something that um, is going to involve me. So they don't have to even read the entire actual toolkit. They just have to kind of be there. Um, so we also included a section on monitoring progress, and we trialed this and uh, I think got it going in early 2013. Probably can't. Can you read that at all? No? Okay. That's a table of contents. <laughs> And uh, it lists the, the 10 uh, main sections. So there's the, there's the monitoring progress section, and then there's uh, some information like, you know, what is psychosis? And then there are sections on, you know, your health and, and a section on, on medication and how, how to talk to your physician. What are the, what are the effects of the medications that you know, are having on you? Uh, a section on managing stress. Uh, a, a, a long section on problem solving that we could have put into the cognition section, but we actually split it off as a separate uh, section. Then there's other other elements like uh, preventing relapse and and um, dealing with uh, symptoms. So again, not that I want you to be able to read this, but this is just an example of what it looks like. So this is from the uh, problem solving section, which is a six step process that people go through. And um, this is an example of what one that's completed would look like. So it's to kind of give the person a model that they can work from. The designer um, w would also put these little characters uh, in the left side that are sprinkled throughout the book, which kind of act as cues for a person when they're reading uh, a page to know that there's something that they, they have to do. So like, you know, the hands up means it's your turn or, the, you know, the professorial glasses means you have to concentrate and read this, that kind of thing. So the, the toolkit was designed for any age to be used, but we, uh, when we needed to create examples, we'd you know, use examples of, of younger people um, just because we'd skew, just, we just skewed it that way. So here's an example of a worksheet. This is from the Solving Problems and uh, where people are asked to um, evaluate possible solutions. And then this is a, a, a section, say, that the uh, support person could help with. Uh, again, this is just showing the uh, graphic of, of, of the support person. And then how to use the toolkit. So it's a self-care guide. Um, but it's a self-care toolkit, but with a guide, not a director. And it's designed that you can start in any order. You can take any section that you want and work on it. Um, we recommend that people do a little bit at a time and begin with small changes. And that uh, we remind them that uh, progress can be slow. And we ask them to try and think about linking what they're doing on any cognitive domain or whatever other chapter that they're working on to the kind of personal goals that they have in terms of getting on with life. Um, we want people to use the worksheets and to evaluate their progress as they're going along, and finally to uh, celebrate the effort that, that they're putting into it and the successes that they're maybe showing. So this is the section on cognition now, and we've talked a lot about, or we've been hearing mostly about uh, these uh, cognitive remediation strategies, in particular about restorative approaches, and the uh, toolkit just focuses on compensatory and adaptive strategies. So adaptive or compensatory strategies are using cognitive strengths to do things that are difficult to do because you might have a cognitive problem. So an example of using a, a compensatory strategy would be that if I'm kind of poor at remembering people's names, but I'm kind of good at, say, rhyming, right? you know, I might go, oh, Paul. Yeah, Paul's tall, so tall Paul, that'll work. Right? Or, you know, the, that woman who lives right beside the, you know, the, the ocean where those all those uh, clamshells are, 
seashells. So her name is Shelly. You know, so it's you know using using something that you're better at in order to compensate. So you, like Alice said, it's it's a kind of a working around rather than trying to res- restore the basic function uh, of uh, of memory. Uh, and adaptive strategies, these are more environmental. The, I think the way to think about it is if you've got a bum knee, you know, you use a cane, you know, that can kind of work. Your knee's not getting better, but you're not, you know, but you're able to get around. Um, so you, I think using day timers and nowadays smartphones are one of the major environmental kinds of uh, aids that people use. So we cover four areas, attention, learning, and memory, uh, some elements of executive functioning, which we call critical thinking, and social cognition. And within each cognition module, we start off by providing a very short and brief definition of, of, of sort of what the cognitive area is and what is social cognition. Then we provide a, a simple uh, checklist of possible indicators of, of maybe having problems in that area, and then we provide some suggested strategies. As well, there's some general tips like the advantage of, okay, perfect, the advantage of uh, telling others uh, that you might have a cognitive problem and how that can be actually a beneficial thing. And um, we also discuss the use of learning preferences. There used to be this literature on learning styles, which I won't get into, but, um, you know, sometimes maybe people prefer to learn in the afternoon, say, for example. So to, to try and, you know, just think about those and, and see how you can use them. Things that I stole off Alice Medelia's <laughs> um, uh, family guide that was mentioned earlier. So this is um, very quickly uh, a look at what um, one area looks like. So you have attention here, and there's some indicators, and then at the bottom, so what are some of the strategies that people can use? So you know you can try focusing on one thing at a time, taking breaks, or using self-talk in order to stay on task. That you know those kinds of strategies. Uh, and then this is the uh, same one for memory. You can't read that. I'm sorry. Uh, but it's using strategies like uh, using memory aids or making use of repetition. So on my final slide, um, this is an example of, of a, a progress form. So uh, somebody at the top has a memory problem. They want to try and remember appointments. So on this t- simple 10-point scale of 1 being no problem and 10 being a huge problem, they rate <clears throat> how they were doing, and then they pick a strategy, implement the strategy, and then later on rate again how they're doing. So that gives you a basic idea of, of what the toolkit is, and it's available for download at all of these different sites, and there's links to other kinds of things. And you can download just individual sections rather than the whole thing. So we think it's a simple tool, but kind of well worth a try. Thanks. Yeah, thanks very much, Tom. That's a really good start. The next uh, presentation is going to be by Dr. Mahesh Menon and Dr. Ivan Torres. They are going to be presenting about adapting cognitive remediations for the refractory psychosis population, people who are not responded well to medication and other usual strategies. So um, there's two of us up here, but really the, the work uh, has been done um, by uh, three of us. Uh, June Lai, who's the OT in our program, is up there, and, and, and she's really been a key part of this process all along. So June, Ivan, and I all work for the BC Psychosis Program, which is a, a tertiary program based at the UBC Hospital, and uh, Randall White is the medical director of that program. So um, what uh, I wanted to just talk about very briefly today is um, using... Uh, cognitive remediation programs in psychosis. We've had a fantastic overview of that from the morning. Um, and for us, really focusing on ways to try to adapt some of these for use in individuals with refractory psychosis. And um, Ivan's going to be talking a little bit about how can we assess the efficacy of the CRT program in our particular population. Uh, this is a cool couple of slides from, from Chris Bowie, uh, who described it this morning without showing you any of the fairly nerdy structural equation modeling, which makes me very happy. Um, but basically, the point of this slide is just to say that, you know, the, the domains of cognition that we see have a huge effect on people's abilities to do uh, community activities and, and work, and they have an impact on those 
independent of the intensity of the negative and the positive symptoms and, and the mood difficulties that they're experiencing. And the, the, there's a very uh, robust uh, body of literature suggesting that there are these cognitive deficits in, in schizophrenia. And this is an, an old paper which is showing uh, the magnitude of cognitive deficits that we see um, in the first episode population, that's those or open squares, and what we can see is in, in folks who have been um, cheated and continue to show persistent symptoms, uh, the magnitude of those deficits is, um, can, can sometimes worsen as well. And so we had decided to, to pick some of the, the same, uh, the usual suspects which have come up in conversation and in, and in the talks earlier today around attention, verbal memory, um, executive functioning, so abstraction, flexibility, and processing speed. And... Um, and we were using uh, one of the programs that Alice had described, which is uh, the fairly cheesily named Scientific Brain Training Pro, um, which uh, it's, it's been very, very widely used. And, and it's actually quite a fun program. So I thought I would show you uh, some of the, uh, the examples of the sorts of tasks that we, that we do. And, um, and, and we do them on, on laptops. And the, the nice thing is that the tasks are, are adaptive, so we can you know, start off easy and, and the levels sort of adjust based on how people are doing. So this is an example from the SBT program around um, an attentional task. So it's basically just call the odd man out. As quickly as you can, you have to identify which one is different and the, the sizes of those grids and the subtlety of the, difficulty, of the differences between the stimuli increases over time. Um, this is an example of... a uh, a standard uh, verbal memory task. So they have they see a list of words and then they see another list and they have to um, identify the words which were in the in the previous one and the number of words and the delay uh, changes as the task difficulty increases. And uh, this is an example of one of the executive functioning tasks. So this is a, a classic task called the Tower of London or the Tower of Hanoi. Uh, essentially, up on the top right, you see. Um, the, the final configuration and at the bottom is what you start off with and you can kind of drag and drop um, those uh, rings from from one post to another with the only uh, rule being that you, you must have a larger one underneath um, and, and a smaller one on top and you have to be able to sort of move the, them around to get to that final configuration and as few moves as possible. So you're really encouraging people to sort of plan ahead and think about ways that you can do this um, and, and the number of moves it takes uh, varies as you get along in the task until um, you have ones which are like over 30 moves is, is the most efficient one. So, um, And so this would be an example where you could get it to match and you say, well, nice try, but you could do it uh, better than that. Um, so we've been trying to pilot it in the BC Psychosis program and uh, one of the things that we've been working around is, yes, there are some of the cognitive challenges, but there are also sort of other difficulties with uh, motivation and engagement around some of these tasks. And that can oftentimes be a big hurdle for us. Um, and then the other thing is just getting people to think about why they're doing these. And so both Chris and Alice have talked very eloquently about the importance of being able to link the tasks to their life goals itself. And so for us, we've been really trying to find ways to make those links very, very explicit and, and the emphasis on promoting um, generalizability of those skills itself. Um, so we had started off with trying to cram the, the, the tasks and the strategies into one session, but we realized that many of our folks, um, that many of our folks actually struggled with it. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so, uh, ah, um, so uh, the the folks that that we see um, are um, people who've had uh, difficulties and persistent symptoms despite uh, taking medications or, or being on, on medications for a while. And so um, uh, the people who are showing, um, we can think of it as treatment-resistant symptoms or, or symptoms despite medication, uh, and the magnitude of real-life difficulties and you know, kind of being able to work in school and, and, and function um, has, has been continually impaired despite uh, 
the, the program that they've, that they've had. So um, we've been trying to find ways to adapt our program to use um, with the folks that we are working with. And so uh, we've been trying to uh, maybe alternate our sessions between one week where they do the computer tasks and then practice that in between sessions, and then another week where we talk very explicitly about strategies and think about ways to implement the strategies in their daily life. And we've been trying to very explicitly link little things that they can do to a larger goal that they might be working towards, which is a big... Um, uh, something that, that we've been, we're still sort of tweaking with the format and playing with because oftentimes if someone says, you know, yes, I do want to go back to school, um, I have no idea why, you know, moving rings on a stick is going to have any connection whatsoever to being able to do that. Um, so we say, okay, um, you do want to be able to do that. And so, for instance, let's think that if you were in school, what would be the sorts of things you would need to be able to do? You would have different classes that you would have to attend. You may have different readings to do and, um, and, and, and homework exercises that you need to do. So you would have to figure out, okay, I have to now plan what is the way that I'm going to do it. I'm going to try to sequence and prioritize this and then see if I can allocate my time efficiently. So what we want you to try and do is, you're going to spend a little bit of time on this one, but then you're going to spend a bunch of time with a mini uh, task, which is a sort of mini short-term goal, which we would link up to that as well. So to say, over this week, I want you to pick four activities that you want to do, and we're going to try to link, um, we're going to try to get you to prioritize and tweak the amount of time that you're spending with it over the course of that we can see what's working and what's not working, which of these strategies you're going to be able to use and really getting people to focus and recognize, um, as, as Chris has pointed out, the kinds of cognitive issues that they have and the kinds of strategies that are actually working for them and, and not. Um, we've been very keen on trying to link both the cognitive piece and the functional piece. So, so June and I uh, run the groups together. And what we've been trying very much to do is to sort of bring this as much as we can into um, their day-to-day -day life. So the way that we've been trying to do this is to share the homework with the rest of the care team, encourage them to share it with family members or friends who come to visit them. And uh, while they're on the unit, the nurses and the rehab workers engage with the patients to follow up on homework, check how they're doing, sit with them, go over some of the strategies that they want to use, um, and so on. Uh, Ivan's going to talk a little bit about the assessment. Okay. Thanks, Mahesh. I'll uh, take the baton here. I'll try to be brief in some of the comments that I make. So I hope that Mahesh is giving you some idea of what the content of the program looks like. And what I'm going to take a few minutes to discuss is really our efforts to essentially evaluate how effective the program is. And so um, there are several different outcomes that we're going to be interested in, in be interested in looking at. And several important things about the outcomes are that, first of all, we want to be able to look at multiple levels of how a person is doing, okay? So these are things that we, we ideally would like to have measurable outcomes that we do before the program starts, and then we also do them after the program starts. And if things go the way that we expect, we hope to see some improvements in these various domains. We also want to be aware of you know, doing assessments that are tolerable for the clients that we work with, and then, of course, to stay within the limits of the resources that we have within the program. So in taking a little bit more of an in-depth look at, at, at the outcomes, um, you know, the, the one that most logically, you know, people would think about would be the actual cognitive performance outcomes. So certainly that's going to be one of the important things that we want to integrate into the, into the program. So in other words, the idea is that when we give these cognitive tests, we hope that when we repeat them after the program that there have been some improvement in objective cognitive function. But we don't want to restrict our outcomes just to improvements on a test, because the reality is, is even though improvements in test performance are something that's favorable, what we ultimately want to see is improvement in the person's functioning and their ability to engage in their daily roles. And so, um, so there's all other levels of uh, outcome that we're interested in. One of them would be also the person's subjective sense of their own rating of, you know, to what degree am I showing these cognitive improvements? Because the test tells kind of a very objective picture, but we're also interested in what the person thinks about their own functions. And then, arguably, the most important level of functioning is that we like to see improvements 
in the person's daily capabilities and their ability to do things in real life. Two minutes, okay. So, very briefly, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail on the cognitive battery, but suffice it to say, to say that we're converging on using an instrument called the NIH Toolbox, which is a computerized um, performance test that, again, taps into a lot of the abilities that we've been talking about today. So things like attention, working memory, processing speed, and several aspects of executive functioning. Um, this is just a sample of uh, what we would call a subjective cognitive functioning uh, outcome measure. And so here, what we would have is uh, the individual patient basically um, give their own ratings about their experience of their own memory and other cognitive abilities. So just briefly, to take maybe the first example on this scale, um, the first item asks, have you noticed any difficulty remembering things? Okay, so the person would rate their, you know, perception of how well their cognitive abilities are. The third level of functioning that we're interested in looking at is a bit of a challenge on an inpatient unit because, um, you know, people are not really re-engaged in their daily activities yet. So we've actually been using uh, an instrument that was actually developed by our own Dr. Tom Eamon several years back, the uh, routine assessment of patient progress, which where we basically have nursing staff rate the functioning of patients on the unit. So the scale is broken up into basic needs, uh, psychopathology, but I think the most relevant one for what we'd like to capture is the life skills. And if you briefly look at this slide, you can see that there's various aspects of functioning that are rated by the nursing staff that allow us to evaluate how well the person is doing kind of in their more daily activities. Okay, so, um, so again, my intention here was just to give you a little bit of a sample of the various levels of outcome that we're interested in evaluating. And, um, you know, I'd like to just provide some acknowledgements for all the people locally that are really behind this program and that provided tremendous support to allow us to at least pilot this uh, within our specialized population. Thanks. Uh, we are moving on to the next presentation. Uh, Dr. Amy Burns is going to present about social cognition in schizophrenia. Thank you. So I was asked to talk about social cognition in schizophrenia because of its important role in functional recovery. So first I wanted to start with just defining what is social cognition. Um, so sh social cognition is any mental operations that underlie social interactions. Um, so basically it's any process by which we act and react to others so examples may be how a patient talks to their doctor in the clinic setting may be very different than how they would talk to the doctor if they bumped into them in the grocery store. Okay. Um, so how we do that, how we change uh, our interaction depends on a number of factors, and they include um, social status, race, sexual orientation, and cultural values. So all of those factors that underlie social interactions can sometimes make it look like there are a lot of unwritten rules in how we interact with other people. So if you can read in the back, it says, does anyone know where we keep the unwritten rules? And it can be sometimes very difficult to na navigate uh, some of those challenging unwritten rules. So there's been a lot of uh, in interest in um, research in social cognition since the year 2000. Um, 
So I looked at uh, Midline and PsycInfo, and uh, between the nine, year 1995 and 2000, there were only five studies published with the keyword social cognition and schizophrenia. And that number increased dramatically. Uh, more recently, between 2010 and 2015, 182 studies have been published with, with social cognition and, schizo and, and schizophrenia. Um, so some of the growth area that we've seen in the field includes defining the domains of social cognition. So if there are lots of unwritten, unwritten rules, how do we define what they are? Okay. Um, how, we do, how do we measure those domains? And what are some of the psychometric properties of some of the measures or the tasks that's being used? So how reliable are they and how valid are they? And these questions are important when they're being used to evaluate changes in social cognition in treatment programs. So some of the domains that have been agreed upon uh, are emotion processing, which is the ability to identify emotional states. So how well can you read somebody's emotional states based on their facial expression, based on their body language? Another domain is attributional style, and this is um, how we evaluate situations with ambiguous causes. Do we tend to attribute them to positive or negative? Uh, tend, do we tend to attribute hostility to certain situations or certain causes? Another domain is social perception, and this is the awareness of social phenomena and the ability to infer motives and values from other people's social behaviors. Another domain, um, last, is the theory of mind, and this is the ability to attribute mental states to oneself and to other people, and to recognize that um, other people may have different desires, beliefs, intentions, and perce perceptions than your own. And so now, there's now been consistent evidence that uh, patients with schizophrenia exhibit deficits on all four of the uh, domains of social cognition. And um, that's compared to healthy controls. And so these deficits are also... Um, when they're compared to other psychiatric groups, such as patients with depression or uh, patients with anxiety disorders. Patients with schizophrenia exhibit more deficits compared to those other psychiatric control groups. So my research while I was uh, at UBC was to understand social cognitive deficits in patients with schizophrenia. So I examined irony comprehension as an index of social cognition so irony comprehension is an interesting phenomenon because um, the utterance, um, when somebody's trying to be ironic, the utterance is in the opposite direction of the intended meaning. So you have to go beyond what the person is saying to understand their communicative intent. So it requires a little bit of, th a bit of theory of mind. Um, and other measures of social cognition that we included was a hinting task, an established measure of theory of mind, and emotional intelligence. And what we found was that healthy controls did quite well across all three domains. So in irony comprehension, they performed in the 93%, um, and hinting task was similar in 92%. And emotion intelligence, um, they scored on the average range. So a scale score has a mean of 100 and standard deviation of 15. So their performance was right uh, at around 100. Um, so that's the healthy controls. And when we uh, compare it to healthy or to patients with schizophrenia, uh, they exhibited more difficulties on irony comprehension, hinting task, and emotional intelligence. Now we also measured. Uh, so this is behavioral measures. We we also measured um, the electrical activity of the brain using EEG while they underwent the irony comprehension task. And what we saw was that uh, on an electrophysiological level, patients had uh, very different brainwave patterns compared to healthy controls. So they they perform more poorly, and it was also reflected in um, EEG activity as well. Now we'll talk about the relationships um, between impaired social cognition, how they relate to other symptoms of schizophrenia. Um, it's a quite busy chart, but we'll walk through um, the chart with you. There's lots of arrows there. Um, so the chart shows the interrelationship between social cognition and other core facets of the disorder. So first, I'll talk about negative symptoms. So impaired social cognition um, is strongly interrelated with and may drive negative symptoms. 
So, for example, social withdrawal, which is a, um, a feature of negative symptoms and also a consequence of uh, faulty social cognition. On the other hand, a lack of motivation, which is very common, uh, commonly seen in negative symptoms, may also uh, drive and reinforce the impaired social cognition. So next are the positive symptoms. Um, now, impaired social cognition may also aggravate or provoke positive symptoms, such as paranoia and delusions, due to you know, faulty and hasty interpretations or jumping to conclusions, which um, um, Alice mentioned earlier, and Todd um, might talk about it later, uh, of the actions and intentions of others. And neurocognitive deficits, such as Difficulties with attention and working memory uh, may also drive the social cognitive deficits. Now, we also know that depression and social anxiety is often comorbid with schizophrenia, and impaired social cognition or the, or the inability to establish rewarding uh, social relationships may lead to depression and social anxiety. And being in a depress depressive state may also exacerbate um, and Make the impaired, uh, make the social cognitive functioning worse. So we know patients with schizophrenia have difficulty with social skills and they affect functioning. Um, what can we do about that? So the, the primary goal of social skills training is to improve communication um, and psychosocial interactions. And social skills training fall under three general types. There are targeted types, um, such as um, where one domain is a focus of uh, tr uh, training, uh, such as emotion perception or theory of mind. There's also the comprehensive uh, type of training, which offers a suite of uh, cognitive skills. So, for example, social cognitive skills training um, trains affect perception, social perception, attributional style, and theory of mind. Now, we also have the broad-based uh, skills training, and these combine social cognition and um, other activities such as cognitive remediation, um, cognitive behavior therapy, and symptom management. So, for example, uh, cognitive enhancement therapy um, trains neurocognitive and social cognitive abilities as well as social skills. Um, cognitive behavior social skills training combines cognitive behavior therapy, or CBT, and uh, social skills training. So how effective are these social skills training programs? Um, Matthew Kurtz and David Penn reviewed the effects of social cognitive training, uh, and they published a study just last year, and they found... Um, Across the four domains of training, they found large effect sizes on training of um, facial affect recognition and social perception. Um, there were moderate uh, effect sizes for training of theory of mind, and attributional style um, <laughs> training uh, resulted in uh, small to medium effect sizes depending on which attribution is being trained. Um, so, for example, hostility blame and aggression, um, the effect sizes ranging from 0.3 to 0.52, so between the small to uh, moderate range. So these are impressive effect sizes, especially for social perception and um, facial affect recognition. But one of the biggest um, weakness in these uh, trials has been that there's been a lack of blind raiders, which could artificially inflate some of the effect sizes that's being seen. Thank you. So in summary, um, the goal of the social skills training is to go from, does anyone know where we keep the unwritten rules, to teaching clients that the situation determines the role we play and the rules we follow. And through training and through practice, uh, teaching clients how to improve some of those social skills. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, uh, Amy. The next presentation is by Dr. Todd Woodward. It's uh, the presentation on treating treatment of symptoms versus cognitive remediation in psychotic disorders. Uh, 
Okay, so I want to start by talking again about the difference between metacognitive training, cognitive behavioral therapy, and cognitive remediation. In order to understand that, you only have to understand this. Actually, it's not that complicated. <laughs> At the bottom here, we have biological levels. So here we have genes, which combine into proteins, lipids, which combine into neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters drive brain networks. But the interesting thing is that brain networks diverge. Just keep going. I can't talk when you do that. <laughs> this is a PowerPoint, Don. Oh, no, this is a, this is a, this is a PDF. This is a PDF. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, we're used to presenting together, so this is different for us. Um, anyway, these, let's, let's just get back to these brain networks, okay? <laughs> <laughs> the point is, the brain networks have cognitive functions. Of course, different brain networks have different cognitive functions that they're responsible for. But my point is, in schizophrenia or psychosis, one brain network, or, um, some brain networks change with time and cause symptoms, like hallucinations and delusions would come and go. Right? But other brain networks are involved in these attention and memory and executive function impairments that we've been talking about today. And so the memory and attention of executive function impairments, actually when they're uh, not, not working well, they end up with poor functional outcomes so the education and work is affected. But the symptoms don't, uh, the so coming and going of delusions and hallucinations actually don't correlate with um, outcome very well. So at the level of behavior, you have hallucinations and delusions in this changing side, and then you have poor functional income, memory, and attention on the non-changing side. So think about different brain networks doing different things, and those brain networks have different cognitive functions, they manifest as different behaviors. So that's just two different aspects of psychosis, one that's changing with time, the symptoms, and one that's staying stable, the one that has these cognitive abilities like attention and memory. So if you can remember those two things, then we can talk about the different treatment, um, that, the treatments that are available that affect different, these different streams. So we have actually three different types of treatment, um, well, three of a variety of different, different ones, but the major ones, at least of medication, of course, affects hallucinations and delusions. They affect the changing aspects of the illness. They don't affect memory, attention, executive function impairments. And they, have, they do that at the level of neurotransmitters, at a more biological level. But these two psychological treatments affect the cognitive level, so the way people think. So unfortunately, cognition means thinking, so that's why it's used so frequently. Cognitive behavior therapy, you teach, you talk to people about their false beliefs. You say, oh, the CAA is, the CAA, you feel like the CAA is watching you? Why do you feel that? Do you have enough evidence to be sure about that? Or what kind of evidence might disconfirm that for you? So how much evidence do you really need to believe something strongly? And how willing are you to undo that belief? We can talk to the person specifically about their belief, and that's cognitive behavioral therapy. Metacognitive training is a method that we developed. And this actually doesn't talk to the person about their delusion specifically, but just talks to them about the way people think. We teach people what it means to gather evidence, how much evidence is necessary to feel that you can be confident in a belief, and also in what situations are you willing or unwilling to undo a belief, but not talking to the people about their specific delusion. So cognitive behavioral therapy... You're talking to the person about the thought process that underlie their specific delusion. Metacognitive training, you're helping people learn about the way we all think and that certain aspects of thinking are affected in schizophrenia or in psychosis. But the other side of, the, of this diagram, where we have these memory and attention of executive function impairments, the only uh, method of treatment that affects that is cognitive remediation. And this has cognitive rehabilitation there, which means the same thing. So, um, with the changing streams are affected by cognitive behavior therapy, metacognitive training, and medication, but the non-changing is affected by cognitive rehabilitation. So, hopefully that helped. Unfortunately, cognitive is a term that means thinking. Thinking is the domain of psychology. So, psychology and training in psychology is where you learn the most about thinking. And so, it doesn't help that it's one domain of study that, that actually encompasses all three of those. So, cognitive remediation... This is just a meta-analysis, so in other words, they summarize all of the different studies that have been done on the effectiveness of cognitive remediation, and this just shows that cognitive remediation does work. Um, This is the average of all the studies on cognitive behavioral therapy in a meta-analysis. This shows that cognitive behavioral therapy is also effective, and this is a meta-analysis on metacognitive training. 
and showing that it's effective too. So, so we're able to have not only medication, but we also have cognitive behavior therapy and metacognitive training that affects symptoms and cognitive remediation that is shown to affect the thinking, the, the um, cognitive abilities that affect um, everyday outcome. And this is a study um, that we did on uh, metacognitive training that um, shows improvement. So this is prior to treatment, post-treatment. This is uh, three months or six months follow-up, and this is three-year follow-up. And we found that from um, two months of training, or maybe uh, it was eight sessions of training, I think, one month or two months, which was it? Two months. That three years later, after the treatment, this was still effective in reducing positive symptoms, delusions, and increased self-esteem. So the fact that you can teach people ways to think about the way they're thinking and that that can be a tool that people can use and can actually have long, long-term long impact. So there are quite a few additional um, methods of treating that's available. And here's some quotations from people that have been through uh, the metacognitive training here in Vancouver. It's not something that cure, is a cure, but it's a, a, well, a wellness tool, a tool that people can use to mute their symptoms and make it easier for them to, to um, process, that, process that type of thinking and to be aware that that thinking is part of their illness and to also be aware that that type of thinking, jumping to conclusions, not wanting to integrate evidence against a belief, is something that everyone shares. None of us are immune from not wanting to change our beliefs or sometimes jumping to conclusions and concluding strongly about something you don't have a lot of evidence for. So, actually, uh, as I've already mentioned, psychology is a domain that's, that's trained most specifically in cognition. And right now we're running a randomized controlled trial in Vancouver on metacognitive training that provides metacognitive training and cognitive remediation to the mental health teams of Vancouver. So the mental health teams of Vancouver actually don't have any psychology services at all. So the only psychology services that are being provided are paid through our research grants that's held by Mahesh and I, and the two people that are providing it are right back there. Could you please stand up, Julia and Megan? So there is your team of people providing psychology services to mental health teams. Also, both of them are very, very busy PhD students. <laughs> they do a fantastic job. And uh, so we have a treatment as usual group, a cognitive remediation group, and a metacognitive training group. And so um, this just shows, again, that we, in that research study, are affecting uh, this stream with the cognitive rehabilitation and this stream with the metacognitive training. We also do brain imaging pre and post. And, of course, we're trying to identify the brain networks that are differentially changing for the cognitive remediation and the metacognitive training, which by now, hopefully, you understand, are different because they diverge and end up with different aspects of behavior affected. So this is just a little bit about the way metacognitive training works. In case you don't know, there are eight modules that are available. They're free. You can, you can download them online. Um, so they take place in a group setting, six to eight people uh, usually, and they're facilitated in our, in our situation. They're facilitated by Julie and Megan. Um, this is just an example. So we work a lot on jumping to conclusions and integrating disconfirming evidence. So in this situation, the group would see this picture, and the group would talk about what this actually is a picture. And we show more and more information, and the group changes their impression of what that is. And what you learn is that you can't know yet, because there's just not enough of information here to know whether this is a sled, a rocking chair, a smiling face, an elephant's head. And so the group has to learn that you can't be 100% sure. And if you think that this is a sled, you might have to disconfirm your belief as more and more evidence is presented. So there's lots of different examples where we kind of introduce these concepts of jumping to conclusions, integrating disconfirming evidence with this type of material. And then we'll expand that to emotion perception. So people with psychosis have difficulty identifying what's on someone's mind based on their facial expressions. So we'll say, okay, we have a cutout picture here. Is this man enjoying a rock festival, shouting something at his friend, calling for help, or is he angry because someone threw mud on him? So the group will discuss that, and then we'll show, oops, then we'll show that actually he's not, he's not angry, he's having a great time. But you can't know until you gather more information, and maybe what you thought in the first place is not completely accurate. Similar type of thing here. Is this man um, passing the finish line? Is he angry? Is he shouting? Or is he worshipping the sun? So the group will talk about that. <laughs> and then it turns out he's angry. So it's a lot of fun. There has to be a lot of discussion. People have to exchange ideas. And the, the, the purpose is, of course, to teach people that these thinking biases um, uh, have to be, you know, people become aware of it. So here's the example of cognitive remediation. Actually, Mesh already showed this. He showed more examples than I do. But this is the different um, types of cognitive training that affect memory and attention that will affect everyday outcome. 
And each, and this is in cognitive remediation, this is um, when we talk to the group about why they're doing this and how the, the um, therapist facilitated cognitive remediation. So this project began in May 2014. We've had 320 people treated through this uh, since uh, 2014. Not all of them have been involved in the research. So sometimes people take part in the group. They don't want to take part in the research. They're not as interested in um, doing the pre-post brain imaging. And so that's possible too. But we're continuing to recruit, and um, Megan and, and Julia have a, have a um, table in the, in the room back there. So I think that's about it, except I also wanted to mention we have a new method of brain modulation. So this is hardware that we just purchased that actually will allow you to induce electrical activity in those 256 spots in the brain instead of one, which has been done so far. We have 256 areas that we can affect simultaneously. So we'll be able to modulate networks of brain activity instead of just one area. So we don't know yet, but that might be able to affect both streams. It might be the only treatment that we'll be able to. It'll take a few years, though, obviously, to find out. Okay, so um, Hesh and I worked together on this project, and you already met Julia and uh, Megan, and uh, thanks to all the other funding sources and grad students. Thank you, Todd. Moving on to the last presentation uh, is Dr. Randall White, who is going to be presenting on the role of medications in improving the cognition in schizophrenia. Uh, thanks. Ashok, you left out a word, limited role, because as you'll hear, we do not have any medication currently approved by a regulatory body, I think anywhere, just for cognitive losses in schizophrenia. But there is, I could end there, but at the risk of being <laughs> ne <clears throat> sorry, nihilistic, uh, so therefore I'll give you some backstory. Um, these are my disclosures. I've received honoraria from Osuka Lundbeck, pharmaceutical company from UBC CPD, and uh, I will only use generic medication names and evidence that's been published in peer-reviewed journals. <clears throat> so the story goes back to the early 2000s uh, in the U.S. at the U.S. Insti National Institute of Mental Health. Uh, there was a um, growing understanding of these cognitive deficits. I don't know why there's this feedback, but... Um, <clears throat> and so a group of um, clinicians, researchers, and policymakers decided to initiate this process to try to jumpstart investigation into possible uh, treatments, medication treatments for these cognitive impairments. It was a multi-stakeholder process involving industry academia, the NIMH, and the US FDA. And one of the uh, products they came up with is uh, this cognitive battery called the Matrix that looks at the seven cognitive domains that are known to be affected, and we've already heard all about this. Uh, this cognitive battery was meant to um, allow measurement of outcomes in clinical trials of medications as well as in cognitive remediation. And there's a website where you can learn more about it. So that was put in place by, you know, 2004. And unfortunately, despite these efforts, as I said, uh, we don't have any available product on the market to treat cognitive impairments in schizophrenia. And one of the papers uh, that I looked at when I was reviewing all this um, the author said, <clears throat> reduction in investment from pharmaceutical companies in developing novel treatments for cognitive impairment is reflected in the paucity of compounds in phase three clinical trials. What that means is that uh, no medication has gone beyond the testing phase. There are three phases in clinical trials. Phase one uh, involves usually less than 100 people it's just to establish that the medication would be safe in the target population. Phase two is a larger study, you know, up to maybe a um, 1,000 people, uh, trying to establish that the medication would, in fact, be beneficial for whatever the target symptom or problem is. And then phase three could involve several thousand people uh, in randomized controlled trials. That means there would be a placebo 
for one group, the medication for another group, and they look to see really if it is more effective than placebo. They look for any serious side effects, et cetera. One medication that has kind of um, come out of this process, this matrix effort, did make it to phase three. Unfortunately, it was terminated in 2016 because it didn't meet uh, the endpoints, i.e. it didn't seem to be effective. However, um, you might be asking, well, what about the antipsychotics that many people with schizophrenia take um, you know, for years? And um, there have been studies looking at the cognitive effects of antipsychotics, both the first generation, that's the old-fashioned ones, like chlorpromazine, haldol, haloperidol, and the second generation ones, like olanzapine or aripiprazole, in both early episode and in uh, chronic patients, and there is a, a small effect on cognition. In other words, their ability in these domains we've been talking about all day, <clears throat> their abilities do improve a bit. And um, one paper I read said only 4% of that is because of reduction of psychosis. Um, in any event, there is a small measurable effect, but clearly it's not enough because many people are on antipsychotics continue to have significant impairing cognitive problems. So, um, despite the fact that the, you know, sort of novel or made-to-purpose molecules or medications haven't made it very far in the testing process, there have been a lot of investigations of uh, medicines or, or molecules that are meant for other purposes or have been looked at for other symptoms uh, you know, of schizophrenia or other mental health problems. And I won't go into a lot of technical detail, but as Todd said, the, the medications target basically neurotransmitters, which are the chemicals that, that nerve cells use to communicate with each other. One area, one kind of... Um, neurotransmitter receptor um, complex is called the NMDA system. And it's been looked at because we know it plays a role in psychosis. But despite various efforts to uh, manipulate that complex to improve symptoms, uh, we haven't had much result uh, except for possibly one medication called memantine that I'll come back to. Um, Another kind of uh, receptor in the brain is affected by a chemical called acetylcholine. And a receptor that acetylcholine acts upon, is uh, there's a group of them called the nicotinergic or nicotinic receptors. Those are affected by nicotine. And we know that people with schizophrenia smoke. They smoke very avidly. And it's thought that that might have some cognitive effects. So it's kind of an obvious target. And in fact, most of the molecules that were looked at out of the matrix process targeted the nicotinic receptors. And then there are medications that are on the market and have been approved to treat Alzheimer's disease. I've listed four here. Denapazil, rivastigmine, galantamine, memantine. And they've also been looked at in schizophrenia. Memantine is the one that affects that thing I called NMDA, there, is, there have been about eight studies looking at it, and it does show some effect. And so I think, you know, there, there may be some interest in, in doing further studies to kind of prove that. Um, and then there's some kind of uh, unexpected efforts in areas such as antibiotics, minocycline, and uh, something called oxytocin. Oxytocin is a hormone that is used as a medication to induce labor. Uh, it's involved in lactation, in uh, childbirth, in social bonding, because when a woman uh, is lactating, the oxytocin is flowing, and that seems to kind of help with the mother-child connection. Um, so it's thought it plays a role in, in you know, social cognition. You can give it IV subcutaneously or intranasally. You know, there have been a number of small short-term studies looking at intranasal oxytocin in 
uh, autism and in schizophrenia, 13 studies. The results are kind of mixed, um, but it may have some effect on social cognition as well as verbal learning. But as I said, these studies are all small, uh, only six weeks maximum. And this molecule is not really patentable for this particular application, so there's no incentive for pharmaceutical companies to do the large trials that we really need to test it. The minocycline is an antibiotic that has uh, neuroprotective effects. It crosses the blood-brain barrier. It reduces inflammation. It prevents the death of, of nerve cells. And it seems to have effect on positive and negative and possibly cognitive symptoms. Further studies are underway. And, and just so there's no confusion, when we talk about negative and positive symptoms, we're not saying that positive symptoms are good. Positive symptoms are symptoms that are kind of in addition to your normal level of functioning. So if you hear voices or you have strange ideas, that's on top of, you know, your normal you know, mental functioning, whereas negative symptoms are things that are subtracted, like interest and uh, motivation. So <clears throat> there actually are these drugs or these molecules that are in phase three clinical trials to look at their effects on cognition and schizophrenia. These, for the most part, have all been approved for other applications, like oxytocin that I mentioned, like memantine. Um, the only uh, nicotinic agent that made it to phase three and senecline, I already mentioned, uh, was nixed when it didn't seem to be meeting uh, you know, the, the expected outcomes. Uh, I'll just touch upon a couple of others. How much time do I have left? Yeah, it's okay. All right. So... Um, for instance, raloxifene is an estrogen uh, agent. It acts on estrogen receptors. Um, it's, it's approved to treat osteoporosis, but there have been studies showing that it helps with psychotic symptoms and possibly cognitive symptoms, interestingly. So uh, it's under investigation. Uh, simvastatin, it's used to treat cholesterol that penetrates the brain. Um, you know, there's some hint that it might be helpful. Aspirin, there's this theory that schizophrenia could involve inflammation at some point during the, you know, the, the, the process of its development. I don't think aspirin's likely to be uh, applied, really, uh, but it has been looked at. Uh, exenatide is a treatment for type 2 diabetes. It's been studied in uh, people with schizophrenia who have metabolic problems, it's very common for people with schizophrenia to have, to be overweight, um, to have high cholesterol, etc. cetera. Uh, exenatide has been studied to treat those problems, and it was found possibly to also help with cognitive problems. So it's being looked at further in that regard. Um, uh, tocopone is used to treat Parkinson's disease. It increases dopamine. Now, in general, in schizophrenia, uh, there's a problem with too much dopamine in certain parts of the brain, but increasing dopamine in the frontal lobe might be beneficial, and uh, tocopone seems to do that. So it's being looked at uh, for, for schizophrenia as well. For motadine, you can buy over-the-counter for indigestion and ulcers. It's been looked at at some trials for psychosis as well as now it's being looked at in a larger trial for cognitive problems. So... Um, I'm not sure if any of this will pan out. Part of it is a lack of funding, um, and part of it is that these are just kind of happenstance findings sometimes, and people have this idea, oh, maybe this will work, we'll test it out a little bit, but again, getting funding for the large-scale cl clinical trials is a huge challenge. Uh, thanks for all the wonderful presentations. Uh, we have an overview of what kind of measures are happening in BC with regards to uh, cognitive remediation and related areas in psychiatry. Um, apart from the fact that Randall could have come and just shown this slide and said, these are the things which are being trialed. <laughs> the reason why I said limited was, as a geriatric psychiatrist, I wake up every day in the hope that there is going to be a medication which is going to fix cognition in dementia. So that's my bias towards medications. 
So we, we have 10 minutes to take questions. So it's an opportunity to ask questions um, to any of our five speakers. Yeah. Yeah. Question on, um, of course, because you were the last one, and this is what I remember more. Inflammation. There's, they're saying about uh, uh, inflammation is found in some cases with schizophrenia. So my question is why we're not talking about diet, sugar, uh, problems, metabolic problems over, uh, that have to do with uh, 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 Fructose, for instance, that's added everywhere and all the chemicals and all that. Why we're not talking about those chemicals and the effects and, yeah, diet, food? Well, we actually, can you hear me? We actually do talk about those things with our patients. Um, I mean, we, we talk about diet. We talk about uh, exercise. Exercise is beneficial for everyone, including people with schizophrenia. Well... I mean, we can talk about it, but it hasn't been the main focus of this um, conference. I don't know if anyone else has any thoughts about, um, you know, the effects of any, like, diet and exercise on cognition per se. Uh, I'm sure it's been looked at, but I haven't reviewed that. (laughs) Alice has something to say? (laughs) In other words, yeah, so exercise is good. And, in fact, we did a study at the BC Psychosis Program where people had 12 weeks of uh, aerobic exercise, and uh, the data is still being looked at. But, basically, we showed that there was some increase in the, the size of a part of the brain involved in memory called the hippocampus. Dr. Wright, I have a question about the tolcopone that's, uh, that's been used for Parkinson disease. I'm wondering whether that's been used to control movement disorders and whether there might be a chance that it might work for people who developed tardive dyskinesia as a result of being an old, on the older antipsychotics because tardive dyskinesia is, really sets them apart from other people because you know if they hum or rock all the time, they really look different, which is very detrimental when you're looking for work. And I'm just wondering whether a tolcopone, is there, if there's any chance that it might work for, um, rever- to reverse tardive dyskinesia. No, unfortunately, it might make it worse because it increases dopamine in the part of the brain uh, that controls movement, and that can make movement worse or, you know, or increase the abnormal movements. There, there, are, there is a medication that was recently approved by the US FDA for, um, for tardive dyskinesia. Um, and I'm failing to recall the name right now, but hopefully it'll be in Canada soon. Yeah. So e- even in Parkinson's disease, talcopone and, and, and tacopone can cause dyskinesia symptoms. So probably they wouldn't probably be a good solution for trialing in tardive dyskinesia. I'm asking because my daughter was just put on the Parkinson's disease to decrease her symptoms, and they actually did. Yeah. She was, yeah. Yeah. Hi, um, my son had a very positive uh, response uh, to clozapine. Within a week, he began to think clearly. He began to um, use his ability to plan, to set goals. He, um, it was a miracle medication for my son. He's been on it now for three and a half, going on four years. He works part-time. He, uh, he's, um, a, he has his own home. He's able to um, plan he uses his cell phone to plan everything on his cell. He does many things that involve a lot of the activities we talked about today. And so that's just a word of encouragement. I'd like your comment on that medication, clozapine. Well, we use it a lot <clears throat> at BC Psychosis. Um, maybe Mahesh has some thoughts about um, the cognitive uh, sort of outcomes when people who are treated with clozapine or Ivan. Yeah, I think 
Thank you. Um, I don't know what the circumstances were with your your son's case. It's wonderful to hear that uh, the outcome has been very positive. Um, you know, I think much of the literature, again, as Randall nicely summarized for us, really doesn't support that these medications provide a substantial improvement. But I'm wondering, in your case, if what might have happened is that the positive symptoms, I assume that there might have been delusions and hallucinations and those kinds of symptoms, that if those are sufficiently severe enough, that by getting improvement in these symptoms, that it actually can um, you know, put you in a place where indirectly it might seem like it's improved. You, know, you, you remove those symptoms so that the underlying cognitive skills that are likely there can actually express themselves. So even though there's probably not a direct you know, mechanism that's affecting these cognitive circuits that Todd was referring to, that probably there might be a secondary kind of uh, phenomenon that's going on that's helping to boost cognition. And in your case, it sounds like not only did it you know, boost the cognition, but also the functioning which is exactly what we want to see. Oh. Um, I have a couple questions, actually. My first question is for cognitive remediation um, with respect to someone like my brother who's lived with schizophrenia for 30 years, um, doesn't take medication, um, seems to function. Um, is there any possibility that cognitive remediation will still help him down the road if he ever decides to go that route? I'd like to say yes, uh, and and I think because a part of it is, uh, for for many people, you know, unlike say uh, dementia or something like that, it's not that the that the cognition sort of is continually worsening. Um, I think for a lot of people there might be a step down, but then it, it sort of plateaus out. Oftentimes, what's really key is trying to find ways to encourage or engage the person in the process itself, because um, you know, doing some of those. Uh, Act, the, the, the computerized activities, as well as really focusing on on the strategy use and the transfer, is something which requires some level of engagement and, and motivation. So I think if there was a point in which he felt like, you know, this is something that I would like to try, it, it might be something which might still be beneficial. I don't think I'll ever try, but we have a lot of people I work with that have that same situation. Their loved one, it's, you know, been looking after them for 30, 40 years or for a great length of time, and then you wonder, is there further hope for them after that many years of living with it? And my last second question is... Can I just follow up on that question? Sorry. There was, I just wanted to also mention that, um, well, first of all, like Mahesh said, the, the cognitive impairments or the cognitive deficiencies are stable over time, so there isn't a great de- decrease, but um, there's not really an increase either. But to make those that we do a lot of brain imaging studies... And I've, I've done, you know, hundreds and hundreds of analyses of comparing people with schizophrenia to healthy controls on brain networks and the efficiency of the brain networks. I've never seen any result that shows that there's sort of one area that's not working or that they're dropping out and using completely different networks. They're always using, people with schizophrenia are using the same networks as the healthy controls, but they use them less efficiently so that to achieve the same level of performance, they have, their neurons just have to, more neurons have to fire and at a higher rate. They can achieve the same level of performance, but as the load gets higher, that's when they start to drop off. So if it's just an efficiency issue, then cognitive remediation, it's not like if someone has brain damage, then you can't really rehabilitate that area because the neurons are just dead. You know, this is just inefficient networks, and that's why cognitive rehabilitation can be successful, and that's why it still could be beneficial for your brother. Right. Uh, and that last question I had was research. How much is the government putting into research today for schizophrenia, out of either provincial or federal? <laughs> All right. So we, we will have time for maybe three more questions, and we'll have to wrap it up for this session. Not so enough. <laughs> I tell you, being at Women's and Children's Hospital, and we have a mental health floor there, and we're right in the place where the where the Women's and Children the Hospital has their foundation, and the amount of money that goes through that hospital for research on children is astounding, and those of us up in the mental health floor don't see much of it at all. <laughs> Sorry, here here for uh, funds for uh, research for adults with mental serious mental illnesses, but that's not my question. It, my my question was. Um, inspired by the, the apparent results of uh, clozapine. And 
it has to do with, I'd ask the panel if you could comment on what measures or metrics or measurement tools there are to give us a base. For example, my son, um, on the, the measures you have described of cognitive cognitive de deficits, is probably a pretty good planner, and he's never late for anything because, uh, um, anyway, that's just the way he is. But his, uh, he's low on the social um, uh, connection aspect. Is there a tool? Are there tools? Can you comment on that, on how we as parents uh, can identify and articulate those deficits in our kids so that we can help get them help? Um, <laughs> So I think it really uh, depends on the types of social deficits you're seeing. Um, as I mentioned earlier, sometimes it's the negative symptoms where there's a lack of motivation or there's a lack of enjoyment from activities uh, that they, were, they normally enjoy doing. So understanding uh, the source, understanding what's behind uh, the lack of social initiative or, or social interaction. There may be some um, anxiety behind uh, social interaction, so fear of other judgment, whether they are um, based in reality or maybe there's a, a, del a delusional component to it. Um, so understanding um, what's behind the um, lack of social uh, interaction will help us more with the treatment planning. I think that's why working with a therapist talking about uh, goal settings and seeing um, maybe that's what you would like to see for your son, but where does your son, um, um, what interest does he have in social interactions? Uh, what are some of his goals uh, with regards to social interactions? Question here. You got two time for two more questions. So, uh, how different is the cognitive remediation uh, program different from the neural feedback program? And are there any studies that show neural feedback might be helpful or not helpful? Uh, Todd, Can you test on neural modulation. Um, does anyone else want to take this question? <laughs> Uh, well, how does it differ? So cognitive remediation mm -hmm. would involve just basically practicing and hopefully under, with the help of a, of a therapist and talking about how the practicing that you're doing applies to everyday life and it's sort of a therapeutic type of situation that would also involve increasing the efficiency of these networks. But neurofeedback, first of all, what brain area are, you know, that involves some instrument that you're actually able to see with a display the activity in that area as you're actually doing a task. Which, in order to actually be able to change your brain looking at some type of feedback, you have to be measuring the brain area or network that is the one that you should be targeting. And that, I think, is we're not there. We're not there. We don't really know which networks to target or which one might be important. And so I don't think there's been very much, uh, well, in my, in my experience with the literature, I haven't seen the same type of, or anywhere near the same type of effect you get with cognitive remediation with neurofeedback. All right, so they will take the last question, but you have opportunity to discuss a lot uh, in the next session uh, about implementing cognitive remediation in BC. So we'll take the last question now, yeah? I would like to ask what you would say are the conditions that need to be in place for an individual before they're really prepared to undertake cognitive remediation therapy. Um, I presume you, they need to have a certain amount of stability before they're going to be motivated to, uh, to participate in group and treatment and um, a consistent program. Because I ask this because... Um, Life happens, and bad things happen to people while they're living. And even when they're stable, sometimes the medication, that can be eroded, and then it causes difficulty. So I guess I'm asking to see whether or not, in order to be able to address and, and implement and get some successful outcomes, whether there's some basic conditions that should be in place. You know, there's sort of the, the old joke, like, 
how many psychologists does it take to change a light bulb? And it's just one, but the light bulb's got to want to change is the joke. But um, often, you know, with, with our study and, and when we're trying to do it in clinical practice, we find that the, that the biggest predictor is really um, if that the person thinks that there is something that they, would, that they might get out of it and they might benefit from engaging with it. And so uh, one of the, the predictors is just really that the person is willing to come in and they are willing to do the homework activity. Um, we've, uh, in, in our group, we've tried to keep the, the, the criteria to come to the group as open as possible, um, just to say that, yeah, we, we're hoping that people can, can come in a um, couple times a week, um, are actually want to be there, and uh, wouldn't be disruptive in the group and are able to sort of understand what, what we're presenting. So we try to keep our inclusion criteria sort of fairly um, open, um, so uh, I would say if if they feel like yep this is something that I'm willing to try then then then, then we can and yeah, I would just say it's kind of obvious to us as clinicians but if somebody is acutely psychotic and you know distracted by voices and all of that then obviously they're they're probably not going to be able to participate very well so you have to get that under control and typically that does require medication. Thanks very much for active participation. Thanks for the speakers. For, uh, <laughs> Sorry, I, I also wanted to add that. So our lab, it's, it's called uh, the Cognitive Neuroscience of Schizophrenia Lab, so CNOS. Uh, and if you are interested in, in the groups or you have family members who might be interested in taking part in the groups, uh, you can just email us at cnos.lab at ubc.ca.